Welcome to CFRI Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the cystic fibrosis community. All right, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm delighted to actually give this talk on cystic fibrosis and hemoptysis. I'd like to start off with, um, I've given this talk multiple times over the last probably 10 years and the reception has not always been great. The reason so is that multiple people are, are afraid of this diagnosis, don't wanna hear about it. But what I found is as time has gone on, I persisted. Over the last five years, things have changed. People are asking for the topic. We're hearing about it more frequently. And in fact, people are having to deal with the real life issues and we're trying to eliminate that factor of fear. Yes, it's a dual, double-edged sword here. We do know there's fear to have it, but to actually have the knowledge and accept what's happening and kind of understand treatment therapies has been very effective. So I, I persist in giving the talk and I think that it's evolved over time and there's a lot to share. So at current, right now, I do not have any disclosures. We'll start off from an epidemiological standpoint. You've all heard this data multiple, multiple times in the past, but let's go through it. We know that CF is an autosomal recessive disorder. It is a genetically transmitted disorder that affects somewhat of 30,000 patients in the United States and an estimated greater than 60,000 um, people individually throughout the world. Now I'd like to actually emphasize, this is older data, probably 2011 data, but what we do know is that worldwide there are centers that don't know have the, have the technology or don't actually know how to make the diagnosis. So I believe that 60,000 is grossly underestimated. And the data still host, holds true for the last number there, where the U.S. incidence is approximately one per 17, I'm sorry, 1,900 to 3,700 Caucasians. A lot of data on this slide here, but what's important, the take home point is there have been multiple trials from 1995 to 2005, actually there's more data all the way to 2010, exploring patients with hemoptysis. We're starting to talk about it. We're showing the world that this does exist and looking at factors that are important as far as how do we get through this, how do we treat it, and what is the prognostication value. From an overall survival standpoint, this is something we've been hearing about a lot. From the 1930s, we all understand that the survival was not that great. We're talking about three months to five months, sometimes six months median survival. Some of the data we're looking at here demonstrate the vast change over time. In 1990, there were some reports showing 30% of patients in the U.S. registry, so our cystic fibrosis reg registry, were greater than the age of 18 years of age. In 2005, that number rose to 43%. I have 2015 data, but I will present to you the 2016 data that looks at 52.6% of patients in the registry were actually above the age of 18. We're talking about 52%-ish of almost 30,000 patients in the U.S. registry. Now the data you see below that looks at some UK reported data, but that is interesting. When that was published back in the 2000 era, they made a great predictive model here. They suggested that in time, the median survival of patients um, you, you know, who were born between the year of 2000 to 2003 were probably going to live over 40 years of age. Now I want to emphasize this is the median survival, this is not the average survival. So what that means is 50% of the patients are above that marker, 50% of patients are below that marker. They also projected that assuming that the care and therapy throughout time were improving, which is what common sense would tell us, that those born after the age of uh, the year of 2000 would live with a median survival of approximately 50 years of age. We have far surpassed that. At the recent Cystic Fibrosis Foundation data that they presented, the median survival is beyond 50 years of age. And this is just a remarkable advancement. And this data is not taking into consideration all the new therapeutics as far as potentiators and modulators that are out there. Here's our data from the 2016 registry. Yes, we're in 2018, but the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is a little delayed as far as getting this data to us. But what I wanna look at importantly is where we stand in California. There are, I mentioned, approximately 30, 29,000, 30,000 patients in the registry. But what we're looking at here, the amount of patients that were at least reported in this period in 2011 was approximately 2,200 patients. What does that mean? 8.34% or 8.34% of patients are actually from California. 
That's the largest distribution of patients throughout the United States. That tells me a lot. Not only do we have exposure to this entire cohort of patients, but they're coming to the center for a lot of reasons, maybe by better diagnostic tools, better recognition of the disease, but certainly it is highly influential to understand this patient population in our um, geographic area. Going back to the epidemiological information, the top line, far right, looks at the, uh, the epidemiology and the amount of patients in the registry. So approximately 29,500 patients were reported in 2016. We're going to touch on that next line a little bit later, but we're looking at the newborns that are being seen here, and it's approximately 900 patients in 2016. This is certainly attributed to, we believe, the newborn screening. As we go down, you'll see that uh, the mortality mark there, there is an influence as far as the total amount of deaths. So there are 373 deaths that were reported in 2016. I would like to emphasize that death is not a marker because we necessarily had progressive deterioration. Patients did not make it towards transplant. In our center and a lot of centers throughout the nation, there are many patients that deem that they do not want to be a transplant candidate. Religious reasons, personal reasons, family reasons, financial reasons, psychiatric reasons. So not everyone is fortunate enough to get a transplant, but some people are fortunate enough to have a quality of life decision that transplant may not be the best for them. But draw your attention a little bit lower there, and at least in 2016, the median survival here was reported at 47.7 years of age. I love this illustration. It's shown every year in the um, annual report by the CFF. But what it dates back to is 1986 and shows the predominance of the pediatric population here. So we're talking about 70%-ish of patients were actually pediatrics. Fast forward to 2016, this is now an adult predominant disease. And I'm gonna show you data a little bit later that the pediatric world, their FEV1s are holding up beautifully. And it's because they're doing a great job with these treatments and now it is actually a disease that we're managing with in the adult population. And of course what that means is that there's an aging population, worsening FEV1 and more progressive disease. I mentioned this earlier in the epidemiological data, but this chart here reflects really the yellow line or orange line, pardon me, the growing number of newborn screening that's being there, a new diagnosis. So this obviously is influenced by the newborn screening. But if you, if you extrapolate this information, what does that tell me? It tells me that if we're growing every year with 800, 900 patients of CF that are born, in time, those patients are eventually going to be moving to the adult world. So as it stands, CF is a small community. It will be a larger community in the next 17, 18 years. But hopefully it will be potentially curative or we have drugs that will halt the disease. I'm here to really emphasize one of the complications of CF. And it's the one thing that people don't talk too much about. It's not as common, but the impact is just paramount and in, it, it's very impactful. So some of the, the complications we see here in cystic fibrosis, diabetes well described, we have hepatobiliary disease which manifests in CF related liver disease and disc malfunction. Sometimes patients actually need a liver transplantation, more so in pediatric than the adult population. We're seeing a, gro seeing a growing population for joint arthropathy, arthritis. This entity has actually over the last 10 years started to blossom to the point where we are realizing that joint pain is real. And this is an entity ref a ref basically reflecting the severity of CF disease that should be treated. And what I'm going to touch on here is the pulmonary manifestations. We all hear about the exacerbations. That's certainly a complication. And the the deterioration of the lungs, but there are other things that we need to focus on. And I would just like to touch right here on um, the hemoptysis that's reported here. We have pneumothoraces, but you'll see here in that second to last line, massive hemoptysis is not so common. So a percent of all of this is about 0.4%, so not a high number. But throughout this talk, I'm going to show you that that is a gigantic number in the context of 0.4% of 30,000 patients, in the context of we have a very hard time managing these patients, and in the context of not all patients with massive hemoptysis have been properly reported to the CF Foundation. So this percentage here is a gross underestimation of the real um, amount that's in there. GI disturbances are common. There's a lot of data now looking at mental health, depression, anxiety being common, and a whole bunch of other things. Cancer as well being talked about, colon cancer being very common amongst the CF patient population, and those listed here, including sinus diseases. Illustration here demonstrates what we talked about earlier, the trends in survival, median survival. So it's looking at five-year increments, but what is important is from 1986 to 19, 2016, you can see here that survival is improved. And I would like to add, a lot of this has not been influential from most of these potentiator correctors. They haven't been around that long. 
What is important here is this is with good therapy, understanding the disease, earlier diagnosis, that we are seeing an improvement in survival. And as I mentioned, 2016, the median survival is listed there at 47.7 years of age. We have to talk about this. It's important to understand where we were and where we're going so we can move forward. We have to acknowledge what are the primary causes of death in patients. And of course, as I mentioned, the most common is either respiratory failure or cardiopulmonary failure here, 66.8% of patients. You'll see a small percentage, approximately 13.9% of patients are represented by the transplant patient population for various reasons, rejection, infection, the list goes on. And so, uh, liver disease becomes a problem. A small touch on that last point about suicidalities or trauma, quite significant. As I mentioned, a growing recognition of depression and anxiety relates to this um, percentage here. Now, let's look at the um, related issues by age. If you'll follow the chart here, we can just list the main ones, diabetes, bone disease, depression, arthritis. You'll notice there's no line here representing hemoptysis. Probably reflects that it's a smaller percentage overall, but I still don't, I still believe people are not reporting it the way it should be reported, just as they're not reporting pneumothoraces and hence it's not made it to the limelight here. Nevertheless, all of these entities are increasing over time and over age as well. The take home point is if you look at the, the increment between 18 to 24 years of age, there's a vast increase thereafter, a steady slope. Actually a pretty big incline. And I'm not sure if it's suddenly it's happening, I actually believe we're looking for it. We're better at diagnosing diabetes, thus the number is going up. We are now understanding the entities here of the bone disease, therefore it's being seen there, and now we're doing mental health screening, so therefore depression anxiety is being diagnosed even more so. And bone density scans are being more enforced. We're actually being stricter in our policies to get this done, so hence the bone disease is increasing. Now, this is the beginning of the talk. I talked a lot about what is going on, how it's led to this point. But really, I think the inception of understanding where to go from this is in um, this particular paper that was written in 2004 by Jan Casas. And basically, what they, they reported here is massive hemoptysis is common in adult patients, 1.8% at that point. So we're talking about 2004. And you see, relative to the pediatric population, not common. But the reason this has taken uh, importance here is now we start focusing on not only is it common, or maybe not so common, but it carries a high mortality. And we'll focus on that a little bit through the talk. Here is the issue. What is the diagnosis and definition of hemoptysis? I'd like to start off by saying, as far as, far as all hemoptysis throughout all disease entities, this disease entity here has the majority of the causes of hemoptysis overall. So there are multiple other diseases, but this is where we see it the most. So from an educational standpoint, this is, we have the most experience. The definition is an expectoration of a large amount of blood and a rapid rate of hemorrhage. The CF Foundation classifies it based on some old theories, such as the American Thoracic Society, have very similar diagnosis uh, or definitions of hemoptysis. That being defined as greater than 240 cc's of blood in a 24-hour period and or recurrent hemorrhage of approximately 100 cc's per day over three to seven days. Now that 100 cc's doesn't have to be all at once, but if you're coughing up that much and it's continued for three consecutive days to seven days, you have an issue. Or certainly sequelae. So these are complications. Patients, even though it's not quite at that high number of bleeding amount, but you've got asphyxiation, airway obstruction, shock, significant hemorrhage, anemia, these patients would all be classified as a hemoptysis that is massive. And why this is important is we need to think about how to treat these patients. I throw in this last a bit here, line here, telling you how complicated this is, because there are about six other papers contesting that criteria for um, massive hemoptysis. Some are 100 cc's, some are 200 cc's. Some say it should be classified as a, a liter of blood. In my opinion, blood is blood. I actually, we actually use a criteria at our center of approximately 100 cc's is on the verge of massive. We don't want to wait till the formal diagnosis of a massive hemoptysis be before we start intervening. What causes this hemoptysis? We think we know what happens. So I want to start off with the lungs are two blood supplies that are going there, okay? We have the pulmonary arter arteries. This is a large, large, large pulmonary artery that's leaving, going to uh, sending deoxygenated blood to the lungs under a low pressure system for gas exchange. And then the other supply are the bronchial arteries. So this is oxygenated blood. It only carries approximately 1% of the circulation and it's under systemic pressure supplied to the lung parenchyma. What does that really mean to us? It means 
the large pulmonary artery is not the one that bleeds. In individuals who were to have a rupture of that main pulmonary, pulmonary artery, we're talking about leaving from the heart, the survival would probably be zero percent. So what we are focused here is the majority of the bleeds are from these smaller vessels, as I said, less than one percent of the circulation. But these, these smaller vessels are problematic, and all of this trouble is coming from these small arteries. Let's look at that a little bit further. So here are some illustrations, and these are cast models. But what is important, the blue represents the trachea and the bronchial tree, so this is the lung. But the red is really looking at the vascular tree. And you'll see the red is like this hyper -prol proliferation. It's a mesh that's going everywhere. And this is the bronchial artery supply. Why is that important? If you look at figure three as well, it shows something very similar. Why is that significant? We have very thin vessels. There are multiple. They're under a high inflammatory burden from the cystic fibrosis that's eroding through the pulmonary wall that's so close to it. It gets through the wall, gets to the adjacent vessel that's already very thin. We inflame that vessel and then they pop. And because it's just these particular vessels of the bronchial arteries are so intimately involved with the trache bronchial tracheal tree, that's what really why they're actually rupturing here. This is a pig model here that's um, basically showing you a few things. But the take home point of this, if you can appreciate um, the bronchial artery neovascularization, so you'll see the arteries. And that what that's doing is anytime we're under a high pressured system or we have a highly inflamed system and the vessels are dying, the body has a beautiful way of reproducing. We call that neovascularization. More and more and more vessels. So it's great in one context because we are able to supply blood where it needs to go. But the problem is it's never going to have the integrity as the initial blood supply. So what happens? It's weaker. Put that in an in inflammatory system, certainly more prone to rupture and hence hemoptysis. So the majority of bleeding is from the bronchial arterial supply, as I mentioned before. Now, this is an important take-home point. Two-thirds of these vessels, this bronchial artery, are coming directly off the ventral aorta, and one-third arise from variable other locations. That's really important to know where it's coming off. The reason that's important is we actually do interventions to, to block these vessels off if they're bleeding. The problem with this is we need to actually get into that main system and go clear to the aorta. So you take pro problematic chances of having a huge negative influence on the aorta and causing more damage. We'll talk about that later. What people have failed to recognize in the past but now acknowledge it's not just these bronchial arteries that are coming off this main tree I'm talking about. There are multifold of bronchial arteries that are the non-bronchial arteries. They're coming off the intercostal muscles, the internal mammary muscles, um, I'm sorry, internal mammary arm arteries, and axillary arteries, just to name a few. I've listed all of these because oftentimes we start searching for the main bronchial arteries and we end up doing something to stop the bleeding and patients have recurrence. And it's because in the past people have not been searching for these non-bronchial arteries. Now we understand that this is a huge, these are huge, huge culprits and we are attacking these as far as the treatment um, therapies. Now, as I mentioned, we, they were initially thin vessels. That's a problem. But in time, before they rupture, that thin vessel is under this huge inflammation, starts to grow with inflammation, and they actually start to curl. So what you get is this enlarged and very torturous artery that's very friable. I mentioned that chronic infl uh, inflammation is probably one of the major contributors to this negative factor that's happening. And the angiogenesis, so that's the neovascularization I talked about ensues. We get this hypervascularity, which is what I demonstrated earlier. We have damage of the vessel and, of course, the propensity for hemorrhage. This is a wonderful display here of what these vessels look like. So if you draw your attention to A, that's somewhat of a normal bronchial tree. You have the small little bronchial arteries, very small coming off. But if you focus on um, B, you can see this hypervascularization. You can see that the vessels are, are very, very thin. They're almost like, um, if you like, a flower-like mesh-like, and certainly you can see how influential this is to rupture because they are so thin. This is a CTA, so it's a CAT scan with angiography. So we give contrast to really study the vessels. So when someone presents to me and is bleeding, one of the first things I do is I order a STAT CT of the chest, CAT scan of the chest with some contrast. And what am I looking at? I'm looking for a very simple thing. 
I send contrast. It gets into the bronchial artery, so we make sure the bronchial artery hasn't ruptured. I've told you that's not common, because if that was the case, they wouldn't be alive to do this. But it will send contrast into all of the arteries of the bronchial tree, the bronchial arteries. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for a few things. I'm looking for the hypervascularity we talked about. But I'm looking for culprit bronchial arteries that might have ruptured. We saw the mesh that I showed you before. It's impossible to go for every single thing. But keep in mind also, side note, if we were to go for everything, it only encompasses 1% of the bronchial circulation, the lung circulation. So you still have 99% of blood coming to it. So you would not kill the lung, but there are influenced by taking too many of these small vessels out. Anyway, so we're looking for the hypervascularity. The second thing I'm looking for is a large, large vessel that's abnormally large and inflamed. Third thing I'm looking for is something that's tortuous, which is an influence from a bad, bad vessel. And of course, the common sense one I'm looking for is a vessel that maybe I can see bleeding. We did a study at our center at Stanford that really, we didn't, we've, in all the patients with massive hemoptysis, at the time of doing the scan, we never found any bleeding in those patients. So it's not common to find that, so therefore we look for other markers. If you look at these, draw your attention to um, the slide, the illustration on the far right here. What you'll see is the main aorta, which is the lo long that, um, line here that's running vertically. And you'll see multiple, multiple kind of serpiginous, serpiginous lines coming out there from there. And that actually re influences and is demonstrating the very, very tortuous bronchial arteries. So in someone who's hemorrhaging, I would actually spend a lot of time looking at this. And probably that's where I would tell the interventionalist, I think this patient is bleeding from one of these uh, torturous vessels. Can you knock that out? And I'll explain what that means later. Okay, so epidemiologically, what do the statistics show? Efrati and colleagues in Israel years ago put out a paper. They looked at kind of five-year increments of patients, and they actually reported 9.1% of all CF Israeli patients reported hemoptysis. The problem with this paper is they really didn't focus on what hemoptysis was, mild, moderate, what was their definition of massive? They really didn't clarify the way we would have liked them to. But they did say that the majority of patients were mild to, you know, scant to moderate. So less than 240 cc's over a course of 24 hours. Um, but they reported that 4.1% of um, CF patients had massive hemoptysis in their lifetime. So of all CF patients throughout time, 4.1% is pretty significant. 60 to 75% of patients were over the age of 18 and notably had disease progression. 1% yearly incident in the age 16 to 20. So this, I'd like to add that this is probably older data. I don't believe that holds true, that, that during that particular group of 16 to eight, um, 20 is the highest risk, and I'll show you why later. But we did know that the most common precipitating factor was the exacerbation of um, a pulmonary infection. And the US prevalence is 0.797 per 10,000, and very similar to the European prevalence. So. Um, Patrick Flume and colleagues in 2005 put this paper out looking at the CF Foundation data. At that time, there were approximately 27,000 patients that they were looking at, 26, 27,000 patients they were looking at, and basically reported massive hemoptysis in general. What was the incidence? So, of those, 858 uh, patients reported. So, that roughly worked out to about 4.1%, very similar to the Israeli study that I talked about. So 4.1% of patients in the registry had an episode of massive hemoptysis by the diagnosis I mentioned before of 240 cc's. And that approximately 75% of patients had one episode at least um, registered. What is more disturbing is if you look at episode two through seven, that 25% of patients could bleed two times, three times, up to seven times and require intervention. And again, this is bleeding at the point that it was massive enough to call it massive and increased your mortality. So this is a problem and it happens frequently. I actually believe the fact that we have better treatments for patients and they're living longer, we have more inflammation, their numbers are getting sicker and sicker. I believe this is a gross underestimate of the amount of massive hemoptysis we're seeing today. So when is the culprit group? When do I have to be concerned? Here is um, kind of this curve looking at the cumulative distribution of age at the first episode. So when am I concerned? Am I concerned the pediatric population? When we look at this, a very small proportion of patients, so less than 25% of patients were seen who are between less than the age of 18. So not common in the pediatric population, but certainly present. The rest of 75% is anywhere in that group between 20 to 50. Again, this is inaccurate to me because we are, I have patients 60, 70, 75, 80, so that we know that they're living longer, but the majority are above the age of 18. But I believe this data holds true. 
the culprit group, the problematic group, is that group between 18 to 30. For whatever reason it is, this is a problem. I think that data is going to change in time. With better potentiators and correctors, patients are going to live longer. So I think that age group is going to shift a little bit older. Are there predictors that are going to tell us is a patient at risk. So aside from a, this age group we've just talked about, aside from just this history, maybe they had it or not, because that's a predictor, but is there anything else? So this Patrick also, and Flum and colleagues, also looked at data one year before PFTs, at the PFTs at the time of bleed, and PFTs one year later. What they found is that overall, when we're looking at FEV1 data, and that's the number that we're all common, commonly talking about, the forced expiratory volume in one second, the average was about 55% in those patients one year prior. So a year prior to this bleed, these patients already had a moderate degree of lung impairment. So these were not healthy patients. They already were, lungs were significantly affected. And you'll see at the year of hemoptysis, if we move from the 55, if you go further over to the right, at the year of hemoptysis, there was a drop in the FEV1 to 52.5% average. And if you follow them one year out, it was statistically significant. They dropped to 50.9. So almost a 5% drop in one year after hemoptysis. So having massive hemoptysis, maybe they're predictors in time, if we look at that they have more of a rapid drop in their FEV1. But certainly if they bleed, they are really going to have a problem with the drop in their FEV1 um, at the one year mark outward. What are risk factors? Other things. So this to me is interesting, but it's not something I want to take home. Some of the variables that met statistical significance, Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, Burkholderia sepatia. But then of all my patients, this is common in most of my patients, at least the Pseudomonas species. So that helps. This is common sense. The next one, the FEV1 of less than 30%. That met statistical significance. So if you had an FEV1 less than 40%, in particular less than 30%, you had a real high chance of actually bleeding. And tube feeds, well, that's actually interesting. Why would tube feeds actually affect our incidence of bleeding? or probability of bleeding. Most people require tube feeds, are malnourished, and their FEV1 is usually quite low. So they all relate together. Liver disease for some reason. I think the other two are interesting, alpha dornase, which is palmazine and inhaled tobramycin. Most patients are on that. But if you're on that, it probably relates to some degree of um, you know, pseudomonas exposure or just very bad lungs. Now, the pulmonary impairment of first massive hemoptysis. So are there other markers that tell us when we're at risk of bleeding? Yes, there are. This, I think this kind of outlines the, one of the best papers to talk about risk factors. Just draw your attention to the far right. Basically, if your FEV1 less than 40%, you had a 60% chance of having hemoptysis my first episode. That's pretty profound. But what bothers me as much is the other extreme, the far left that approximately 10 to 11% of patients had normal FEV1. And this, I think that's a gross underestimation. I'm seeing it more and more. I think our center is a little higher than that, about 11 to 12%. So you can have absolutely normal breathing numbers and still have a massive hemoptysis. So this is not necessarily a disease of those who are incredibly ill, even though it's more common amongst them. It's something that can affect those with normal lungs. So we need to always talk about this. What does this mean for survival? How does it affect you to actually have massive hemoptysis? Let's just focus on the far left of the screen. We have already talked that the high risk factors are an FEV1 less than 30%. If you have this, the black line represents hemoptysis. Your two-year two mortality is pretty high. And this actually holds true to this day. So my patient who tells me that they've had or, or we've diagnosed massive hemoptysis, I have other red flags going up that their chance of passing away in the next two years is very high. And this is not related to not making a transplant. It can be related to multiple other things, acute respiratory failure, getting on the ventilator and not making it to transplantation or bleeding again. As I mentioned earlier, you have a 25% chance of having a recurrent hemoptysis of two, three, up to seven times. This is looking at survival following massive hemoptysis. Um, the take, you can see this trend in the time, it's actually a rapid decline in survival. But what I think is important is up to that first year mark here, there's approximately 35% approximately drop in your survival after one year. So we talked about the high rate at two years, but one year, just 35%, just because you've had hemoptysis in itself. That makes sense to me. Something has happened that you can inflame so significantly through your lungs into that vessel and bleed. So this number does not surprise me. It's real and it's something we need to be concerned about. So 
I've talked about this on the slides. Mortality, 35% will die within the first year. If you're in the hospital, you can see the mortality is slightly, it's less, 9 to 13%. This is older data. I think, it's, I think it's less because we can intervene. Maybe we have time to get to mass, to interventionalists to actually do bronchial artery embolization. Maybe we can get them on a ventilator faster. Maybe you can list them faster for urgent lung transplantation. So something to keep in mind. Overall, though, the mortality is 30 to 50% in patients who've had any episode of massive hemoptysis. This makes sense, that next line. If you bled to the point that you need a blood transfusion, you've really bled. So it increases your risk of dying. Now, I put the, the next one with three asterisks. There's one small study, an Israeli study, that said there was no mortality in the hemoptysis group. That's a flawed study. They never identified if those patients were all massive. I think the majority were scant and moderate, and that's why they didn't see a mortality um, influence. Now, in 2010, the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine sent a consensus out to all directors across the United States. I was one of the members on this paper here. And they asked simple questions such as, when should you contact your provider? That's all they asked me. So what did I think? If you had less than five cc's, mild to moderate, massive. So, and then we just basically took a consensus statement it's, this is not a vigorous study at all because there's no study to tell us. It was more of an evidence-based, not non-evidence-based professional expertise opinion. When to admit? Well, let's look at when to admit. If you're less than five cc's, no, maybe you should call the provider, maybe not. No one knew what to do in that bleeding between five to 240 cc's, and of course, massive. Yes, you should um, admit them. So you can see the problem here already. What do you do between 5 and 240 cc's? I started this paper, this discussion, stating 100 cc's is significant to me. But this, our, the consensus across the United States was we're not quite sure if we should admit them or not. If you had 50 cc's, I would admit you, because I don't know what's going to happen around the corner. I will also like to add, a lot of doctors were asked, some of them are for very small centers that haven't seen the amount of illness that we've had. Some of them don't have the sickest patients because they don't have an associated transplant center. So this is something we see a lot of and have a lot more expertise of the, the badness that could be around the corner. Um, what I think is the most disturbing of this, and I knew what my answer is, so I can tell you right now my answer. Look at the last two, the second to last. Should this patient undergo an embolization? Less than five cc's, of course, no. Everyone felt no. Five to 240 cc's, they questioned that. You're right, it could be five, it could be 10, no. But it could be 100, 240, so that is meaningless. What bothers me the most is if you said massive. 240 cc's of blood or greater. Um, they didn't know. There was a mixed consensus on that. And we believe the influence is probably because a lot of centers don't have bronchial artery embolization. A lot of centers aren't, uh, don't know what to do with this at all. So there's this hesitancy as far as what should we do, what should we shouldn't do. But there was some little no, no tabina there stating that, yes, we should do embolization on these patients if they were unstable. Okay and the bronchoscopy was done. We don't barely do bronchoscopies anymore. So either, although it was 2010, we're eight years later, but even then we didn't really know what to do with this patient population. What am I getting at? It is unpredictable. I've given you predictors. We really don't know who's going to bleed, who's not going to bleed. If you bled, I really don't know if you're going to bleed in 24 hours, how you're going to do it again. So it is, it's common sense rules, and this paper doesn't really guide me. So it's expertise or, or calling a center that knows what to do with these patients. So here's the embolization I've mentioned. This is something, the initial cases are in the 1970s. We know it's effective and it's safe. This has been done over and over again. What I love about this paper here, this data here, is if you've had one embolization, so you bleed, you have the embolization, 75% of the time will be successful. If you bled again and you've had to have the second embolization, almost 90%. And the third time, 93%. So, Nobody wants to go three embolizations, but at least the more you get, you're, you're hitting out different vessels. You're eventually going to get there. I'm not sure that's the path I'm going to suggest to people, but that's what the paper showed. Problematic, next line, recurrence rate. So even if you did the embolization, anywhere between 38 to 46-ish percent of patients will have another bleed. So be ready to deal with that. And if you're going to bleed, you're going to bleed within 12 months. So I, um, you're on red alert if you've bled, and you're red alert if I've done an embolization. And in the next 12 months, you are seen very frequently in clinic just to make sure. Now, I alluded to this earlier, and I spent some time, but this is where the data comes from. 75% with bleeding from non-bronchial arteries after embolization. So that's what I was getting at. 
we go for the big vessels and we forget about the non-bronchial arteries. So now we're looking back. So if you've embolized and you still bled, this is probably where you're bleeding from, these smaller contributories. So not much to talk about here, I've already mentioned, but draw your eye to the far right of the screen where we have repeat embolizations. So these are multiple studies from the 70s to the mid 90s, but basically, how many times do you have to embolize the same patients? Anywhere between 30-ish, 31%, all the way to 55%. So recurrence is common, we have to be ready, and you also have to have a good CAT scan to evaluate these patients. This large study by Car Carnalba and colleagues in 2011 looked at, this is probably the longest longitudinal study, 31 year experience of doing bronchial artery embolization and non-bronchial artery embolization. 500 -ish patients, what I love about it is like we're 23%, so one quarter were CF patients. And what they were looking at is really what, what happens after you do, how these patients fare. I mentioned earlier that we send a catheter into the growing, we send it into the aorta, and we start putting pellets in there, this gel that goes in there to block off the circulation. So if you think about it, you're sending a substance in there. It certainly could embolize and go to the brain. You could get a stroke. You could cut off one of the arteries in the aorta. So there are multiple complications with this and many strokes. But what they showed is that the risk was very low, which holds true today, 0.6% risk of a mini stroke or a stroke. There were some minor complications that were noted. 60% had chest pain and good 20%. So one out of every, you know, one fifth of patients had pain with swallowing. And we believe that some of these very small contributories to the gastric system are being cut off, but it's minor. So patients feel this temporarily. Relapsed hemoptysis in 38% of CF patients and only 21% um, seen in other diseases. So I think this is also interesting. If you have someone who bleeds from another disease and that for CF, other diseases are fine, they may do well, CF will recur. And again, it's because this inflammation hasn't stopped, it's a continuum. Um, a side note, if you've had a fungal ball, you guys will, even if I embolize, you'll continue to bleed. bleed. I mentioned before about getting into that artery, aorta, and embolizing. The one of the dreaded fears of doing embolization, so it's not something I keep saying, keep going back, is the spinal artery, the anterior spinal artery is very close to the bronchial artery, very close. So there's always a concern that when you embolize and send these pellets off, they may go into the bronchial artery, but they may go into very close spinal artery and cause paralysis. So we're always concerned as para patients being paralyzed after this procedure. And in this um, study, they reported one to 6% chance. Our data here at Stanford has been beautifully zero in the last 30 years, but that's a center of expertise. Patients can get inflammation, they can send some, this is very rare, you can get death of that segment of the, of the lung that you've embolized off. Um, you can get some dissection in the artery, so we've split the artery a little bit, and then um, you can get an embolism going to the brain. These sound very traumatic, but the risk and of dying from the hemoptysis is so great that this is the only intervention we have, and they're very, very low risk. So bronchial artery embolization in adult CF patients, they looked at the impact on clinical course and survival here. And if you look really overall, what it's suggesting here, it's a lot of information, but in time, the FEV1 actually did pretty well with these patients if you can get into the embolization pretty quickly. And when you look at the risk of bronchial artery uh, of death or lung transplantation, you know, it met statistical significance. So what does that mean? Common sense, if you bled enough, to require an embolization, your highest risk of death or need for transplantation. I told you that before, you're sicker, you had lower FEV1, you had higher risk, so this makes sense to us. This is another way to look at survival in time. The um, top line represents the control, bottom line represents embolization. You can see rapid, you know, survival goes down significantly right after embolization. Um, and then lastly, the relative risk of death or recurrent major hemoptysis after bronchial artery embolization. So it's about a, it's significant in a certain analysis. One of the things I've highlighted at the bottom here is that if you have multiple vessels, these non-bronchial arteries um, vessels, you're at higher risk of bleeding. So multiple, multiple vessels means higher risk of bleeding. This question comes up now nationally. What if you don't have massive hemoptysis? What if you have a patient that comes in with 5, 10, 15, 30 cc's of blood every couple of months over the course of a year? What should you do with those patients? Our fear is this is called a sentinel event, which means it's a sign that this vessel is inflamed that you're gonna get into trouble and the major bleeds around the corner. So 
should we intervene? This small study looked at some 30 patients. It wasn't large. It was reported in chest of 2002. And they looked at certain prognostication factors. So the first of which, if you look at the top left corner here, episodes of hemoptysis per year. The straight line is just regular conventional therapy. That means no embolization. And the da dashed line represents those who had embolization. So over a three-year period, if you had non-massive hemoptysis, yeah, this small study showed that maybe you didn't re-bleed in that within the three years, so it really was helpful. Draw your attention to the far right. There was some thought that if you embolize these patients with non-massive, that maybe they didn't have as many exacerbations per year. I don't know why that makes sense at all. I think it's just a coincidence, but that's what they showed. But I think also interestingly, so the bottom left here, when they looked at FEV1, it didn't have any impact at all. It was not very influential. So FEV1 didn't change at all. And then they looked at a specific schwannoma score for embolization, but we won't get into that today. Okay, we're drawing to an end. What about those patients who have failed embolization? Those patients that continue to bleed or those patients we've embolized where there's nowhere else to embolize? There are certain things that have been considered. One of which a paper was written a few years ago in 2012 that looked at beta blockers. So things that we use to bring down the heart rate. And what the thought here is, if we bring down the heart rate, we bring down the pressure in the aorta, that pressure in the aorta brings down the pressure in the bronchial arteries, and then it takes that huge systemic pressure off of the um, bronchial arteries. It was actually quite successful in this abstract report, which never really made it to great publication. I think it should have been published. But they said there was termination of hemoptysis in approximately 72.7% .7 of patients, and it decreased the frequency of hemoptysis and decreased hospitalization over the course of a year. Now, I think, so I have to be able to analyze this academically. That's great over a year, but then we talked, most of the data is looked over two years as far as what happens in two years. But nevertheless, I think that it's something I've considered and something I've used before. In patients who have major hemorrhage, there's something referred to as recombinant factor seven. This is something that's used in the military for massive hemorrhage. It's basically an injection we give and we basically just clot up everything. So. I think it's something to be considered. Have I used it? Yes, once. But the problem is, I just said you clot off everything. So you start clotting the bleeding. You may close, um, stop the bleeding, but you may get deep, deep venous thrombosis. You may get a clot somewhere else. But again, risk and benefits here. There's a lot of discussion, and I am very opposed to this, but looking at bronchoscopies and balloon tamponade. There are no reports in the CF patient population. All cen many centers who are inexperienced talk about patients who are hemorrhaging, sending a camera into the lungs looking for the hemorrhage. We've been writing about their saying, well, number one, you're going to put them on the breathing machine. So think about that. These patients are sicker than everyone else. You put them on the breathing machine. Now the consequence is I can't get you off the breathing machine. We may treat the bleeding, but now you're stuck on a ventilator and exp expedited your need for transplantation. But more so, if you have bled 240 cc's, blood's going to be everywhere. You're not going to see where this site of bleeding is. And in fact, I actually believe, and I've been writing about this over the last few years, that this contributes to more inflammation to send a scope into the lungs, and it's just these patients cannot afford that. I also believe that it delays the need for moving for the embolization, so it's something that needs to be done. Um, in the older literature, it's been well described in patients who are hemorrhaging where you know they're hemorrhaging from, and no matter what you do, no matter what you do, embolization, they continue to hemorrhage. Some old data suggests taking the lungs out. We've never had to resort to that here, take that side of the lung out or lobectomy. Um, but you can all imagine in patients who have impaired lungs already, I've told you that these patients are the sickest of the sickest patients. They don't have much reserve. So trying to take a whole lung out basically sets you up for failure overall. So it's usually not a good option in these patients. So in summary, the exact de definition of massive hemoptysis remains controversial. The sig significant amount of patients will experience an episode of massive hemoptysis, and we do know that the majority of these patients are greater than the age of 18. There is an incredibly high rate of recurrence that we need to know about, and it is most commonly associated with a pulmonary exacerbation. We do know that there is uh, a previous and current rate of a reduction in forced vital capacity, FEV1, in these, this patient population. We know that bronchoscopy is controversial and might actually delay the optimal therapy of bronchial artery embolization. I have demonstrated that bronchial artery embolization is safe, effective, with some adverse effects that we need to know about. The, as I said, the risk of major adverse effects are low, 
repeat bronchial artery embolization with successful termination of hemoptysis with multiple attempts, particularly with the non-bronchial um, uh, arteries. And then salvage therapy should be considered for refractory cases. Thank you.